Shameless Copycat Guns in History Weapons manufacturing is the backbone of each country's defense system. Having a domestic defense industry provides a country with the capability of defending its territory and interests independently. Production of weapons, even if they're small arms, is an expensive and complex business, however. It takes a lot of time, expert knowledge, and money to design the weapon, test it, and finally put it into production. That's why many countries resort to the licensed production of firearms. It's far cheaper and more efficient to produce a weapon that another country has developed. It can, however, come at the price of political and diplomatic strain. It's not uncommon to find that some countries resort to unlicensed weapon production, usually by industrial espionage, and be used to make copycat weapons. Some of these weapons have only a couple of so-called borrowed features, while others are complete clones of the originals. The MP3008 From the offset of World War II, Germany was one of the few countries whose soldiers had been issued with submachine guns. These came from the vast arsenal of weapons that they managed to mass-produce during the build-up to hostilities, the main iconic one being the MP40. During the early stages of the war, Britain and her allies had absolutely nothing to match these new, light, rapid-firing weapons. So instead, they began to purchase thousands of US-made Thompson M1928 and later M1A1 submachine guns. This was still not enough to match the Germans, however. The solution was the Sten submachine gun, a simple design and, importantly, a low production cost weapon. Millions of Stens consisting of various versions were produced during and after the war. The weapon, over its period of use, developed a poor reputation and was regarded as being one of the least popular submachine guns of the time, only being accurate at very short ranges. The Sten, however, was successful in serving its purpose as a cheap and easily manufactured weapon to equip soldiers on a large scale. The tides of war continued changing as the war neared its end. Allied bombing crippled the German war industry, and it lost almost all of its momentum. As a result, in early 1945, its ability to keep the German war machine rolling was failing. The Germans therefore tried to create their own version of the Sten gun by producing a very similar type of weapon. It turned out that the German submachine guns became almost complete replicas of the Sten Mark II. The Germans got a hold of the British Sten Mark II submachine guns in the early stages of the war. They found the gun to be of poor quality and incomparable to the far superior MP40s. However, in 1945, the desperate situation began calling for desperate measures. The shortage of submachine guns became almost completely intolerable, and the value of this weapon, which could be mass-produced with little effort, was needed imminently as the weapon to equip the Volkssturm units, otherwise known as Germany's People's Militia. The result was a submachine gun model named the MP3008. German designers copied the British Sten Mark II almost down to the last detail. The only part that differed was the down-facing magazine stick of the MP38 and MP40, compared to the Sten's side-mounted magazine. In the last days of its production, the MP3008 also had its distinctive steel buttstock replaced with a wooden one. This was a result of the massive shortage of materials. The weapon was produced by the leading German arms manufacturers of Mauser, Hainel, and Walther, along with collaboration from others. No more than 10,000 copies of the weapon were made before the end of the war. However, the Mauser factory continued to produce a very similar version known as the Garat Potsdam, or the Potsdam device. This weapon was another clone of the Sten Mark II. In the end, neither of these submachine guns helped the Germans avoid total defeat in the war. In fact, it only revealed the true desperation the Germans felt in the last days of the war. The IMI Galil When a country's safety is at stake, all options are on the table, including copying weapons. During the Six-Day War, the Israelis discovered that their standard army-issue FNFALs performed poorly in the desert conditions, compared to the Egyptian, Soviet-built AK-47s. Although often less precise, the AK-47 was a far more reliable and sturdy weapon. More importantly, it could withstand almost all types of conditions, and that was what the Israelis were looking for – great reliability. The end goal was to create an AK-47 version that could be as precise as an M16 or FNFAL. 
the government opened a competition for a new standard-issue assault rifle. Out of the several designs considered, the Israeli government ended up choosing a rifle designed by Yisrael Galil, a Palestinian inventor, and his colleague Yaakov Lior. Since the army was looking for a rifle similar to that of the AK-47, Galil and Lior resorted to copying the mechanism and the receiver design from another AK-47 copy, the Finnish RK-62 assault rifle. The Finns had based their design on a Polish license-built AK-47. This resulted in the production of a very high-quality weapon. The superior build quality was exactly the reason that the RK-62 caught the Israelis' attention. After thoroughly researching the Finnish rifle, Galil and Lior used it as a base for their design. The first Galil rifles to be manufactured had the actual receivers from the RK-62 built into them. The Galil platform contained a Kalashnikov pattern gas-driven piston system. The crucial difference was that the barrel was chambered for the NATO 556 by 45 mm round, unlike the RK-62, which fired 762 by 39 mm rounds. Using the 556 rounds produced a much higher operating pressure and therefore called for a change in the receiver design. Instead of using the stamped and riveted steel sheet metal receivers, Galil introduced a milled forge type. These improved the rifle's durability, but also increased its overall weight. Along with the standard AK-47 type fire selector switch on the right-hand side of the receiver, the Galil also had a thumb selector on the left face, just above the pistol grip. The tests, conducted in the late 1960s and early 1970s, acted as an assurance for the Israeli military that choosing the Galil rifle as the new standard issue rifle was the right decision. Following this, the rifle began being produced by the government-owned Israeli military industries, hence the abbreviation IMI Galil. Starting from the mid-1970s and for almost two decades, the IMI Galil, the pride of the domestic defense industry, was the official service rifle of the Israeli Defense Forces. However, the events of the 1973 Yom Kippur War forced the Israelis to arm their soldiers with another rifle. Since the production of the Galil was slow and expensive, and the army needed a large number of rifles immediately, the government obtained 60,000 M16A1 assault rifles through the U.S. military aid program. Instead of the Galil, the Israeli soldiers were now armed with American-made M16A1s, which were often preferred by the majority of Israeli soldiers. Nevertheless, the Galil remained in service across all branches and was the weapon of choice of the Knesset Guard, the Israeli Protective Security Unit. Up until 1998, the IMI Galils continued to be manufactured in three basic configurations. The Automatic Rifle Machine Gun, or ARM for short, the Automatic Rifle, or AR, and the Short Automatic Rifle, or SAR. IMI Galils were used in all three versions by military and police forces worldwide. The rifle was also licensed manufactured in Italy, South Africa, Sweden, and Myanmar, which was formerly known as Burma. The Type 36 During World War II, the United States Lend-Lease program led to the American manufactured weapons being widely used in numerous conflicts all across the globe. For example, American guns were used by Allied troops as well as by guerrillas in the Balkans, as well as by troops of the Kuomintang in China. As part of this program, nationalist Chinese forces received large quantities of the U.S. M3 and M3A1 grease gun submachine guns. When the war ended and the Lend-Lease program ceased, the import of these firearms to the country was reduced significantly. However, the nationalist Chinese forces were still in need of weapons because of the domestic hostilities between the nationalists and the communists, which raged for another four years after World War II had ended. After the communists had eventually gained the upper hand by utilizing large amounts of weapons abandoned by the Japanese after the Second World War, the nationalists tried to match their strength by increasing their own arms production. For this purpose, the nationalist-controlled Shenyang arsenal near Mukden began production of grease gun copies. The submachine gun, which was a near-exact copy of the M3A1, was designated the Type 36. The name came about because they adopted it in the year 1947, otherwise known as the 36th year of the Chinese Republic calendar, which started in 1912, the year when the Republic of China was founded. 
Although the Type 36 used the same 45 ACP ammunition and differed from the M3A1 only by a different barrel nut and the lack of an oil container inside the pistol grip, most parts were not interchangeable. Despite being a very close copy of the grease gun platform, the Type 36 was a comparably low-quality weapon. Although a seemingly simple weapon, the grease gun required a complicated manufacturing process involving large stamping machines, something the Chinese did not have at the time. Still, the fact that the Shenyang Arms Company lacked the proper machinery did not stop the nationalists from producing around 10,000 copies of the Type 36. The Type 37 was introduced the following year, this time chambered for 9mm parabellum rounds. In 1949, when the Communists gained control of mainland China, the Nationalists were forced to move the entire production line from the Shenyang Arsenal to Formosa, the island which is now known as Taiwan. There, they continued the production of the Type 37 under its new designation, the Type 39. During the hostilities, the Communist forces captured a significant amount of the Type 36s and Type 37s. They later used these weapons against the Americans in Korea and Vietnam. The Norinco CQ-311 The Chinese did not stop copying American weapons with the Type 36 grease gun clone. In fact, the act of copying weapons has continued in the country right up until the present day. One of the most blatant examples of a Chinese copy is the CQ-311, a 5.56mm caliber assault rifle manufactured by the notorious Norinco Company. The CQ-311, or the CQ-M-311, was introduced in the early 1980s and is a direct clone of Colt's AR-15 platform, more specifically the M-16 series of rifles. Like the original, the CQ-311 is also produced in two versions, the military version with selective fire and the semi-automatic version for the civilian market, designated the CQ-311-1. Although a direct copy of the American M-16, the CQ-311 has several minor differences, the most recognizable being the curved hand grip. Apart from that, the CQ-311 also has a different forestock and foresight. What can't be seen, though, is the difference in the quality of the materials used. While Colt uses T70-74 aluminum in the manufacturing process, Dorinko uses T60-60 aluminum, which uses metal injection molding rather than the arguably superior forging technique the American company uses. The clone CQ-311 has the same barrel as the original M16, with a length of 19.9 inches, or 508 millimeters, as well as a 1 in 12 rifling twist, which allows it to fire the same type of ammunition, the 5.56mm ball M193 NATO cartridge. Along with this, Norinco has also cloned the ammo and designated it the Type CJ cartridge. The civilian version uses the 223 Remington commercial cartridge. In 2006, Norinco introduced a carbine version, the CQ-311 Type A. Needless to say, the carbine was also a clone of the American M4A1 assault carbine. Despite being a state-owned defense corporation, Norinco's CQ-311 assault rifles are produced for export only. Not a single copy has been issued to the Chinese armed forces. However, armies and police forces worldwide, mainly in Africa and Asia, have the CQ-311 in their armaments, primarily because of the low cost of the weapon. The commercial version was also sold in the United States and Canada, but was later prohibited in 1989 and 2020, respectively. However, this version can still be bought in Italy, Ukraine, and South Africa. Although a lesser quality weapon, the CQ-311 remains in competition with the American manufacturers, primarily because of its significantly lower cost than the real thing. The M53 Machine Gun Straightforward cloning is almost always performed in a manner known as reverse engineering. This process involves deconstructing the target weapon into individual components to extract design information. Once obtained, the data is merged into technical documentation needed to manufacture the clone. After World War II ended, Yugoslav engineers from the Cervena Zastavar factory used this method to make a copy of the notorious German MG42 machine gun, which they called the M53. Being one of the best machine guns of the war, the MG42 was used extensively in the post-war years as a model for licensed and unlicensed production. Other manufacturers directly copied parts of its mechanism in the designing of new types of machine guns. 
The Yugoslavs took advantage of the fact that the Germans had occupied the country during the war and that hundreds of MG42s were left behind by the occupying troops. The captured guns were issued to the newly formed Yugoslav People's Army, whose leaders decided to make the MG42 the standard issue machine gun. Since there was no way of purchasing it from the Germans, the Yugoslavs had to make their own copies. Even though they had original examples at their disposal and probably had access to the original technical documentation provided by the Soviets, creating a clone weapon remained a difficult task. The main problem was the standard Yugoslav 7.9mm cartridge, the Ball M49. Even though it was the same caliber as the 7.92 by 57mm Mauser cartridge that the MG42 used, the M49 had a somewhat heavier bullet which produced frequent jams, as well as broken shell casings and other weapon parts. The Yugoslav engineers approached Rheinmetall for help, but were turned down by the Germans who didn't want to take part in the reverse engineering of their own design. Eventually, one of the Yugoslav engineers approached Professor Werner Gruner at the Dresden Institute of Mechanical Engineering, the original designer of the MG42. Gruner obliged and offered his assistance. Thanks to his help, the Yugoslavs solved the problems of shortening the length of the recoil spring and thus reducing the rate of fire. In 1953, Rheinmetall sued the Yugoslavs at the International Court of Justice in The Hague for violating their patent rights. The Yugoslavs won the case, however, by claiming that the patents were part of Germany's post-war indemnities. The Yugoslavs ultimately produced over 40,000 copies of the M53 before the Soviet PKM General Purpose Machine Gun later replaced it. In the world of weapons manufacturing, copying is a common occurrence. Most often it comes as a part of various license agreements. There are examples, however, when manufacturers resort to illegal methods of obtaining technical documentation for the weapons they wish to create. The result is often a blatant, shameful ripoff of the original. Shameless Copycat Vehicles in History Unlike cheating on a test in school, copying a design for a piece of military technology is almost as difficult as coming up with the original innovation. Even if a country had access to an original piece of equipment, disassembling and reworking the construction process is nearly impossible without blueprints detailing the manufacturer's process. Frame it this way, the original recipe for Coca-Cola is available for everyone online. But no matter how hard you try, nothing you make will taste exactly the same. For military vehicles, general shapes and material may be replicated, but things such as hardness, tempering, heat treatments, and machine precision cuts are impossible to get exact, leading to an avalanche of design problems in the copied product. Chinese PLZ-05 tank, copied from Soviet Union 2S-19 Emsta S tank, the defense industry of Russia has a vested interest in exporting advanced weaponry to China. Through their exchange, Russia is provided with both an eager buyer, ready to spend massive amounts of money in stimulating Russian manufacturing, and a way to indirectly curb U.S. power in Asia by bolstering Chinese defenses to reduce pressure on their own flanks. However, this exchange isn't without drawbacks, as Russian weapons often fall victim to Chinese copycats. China will buy Russian supplies in limited quantities just to take the technology apart and make copies of it. These Chinese copies are then sold around the world, undercutting Russian exports. One glaring example of this is the Chinese PLZ-05, which is a shameless knockoff of the Soviet Union's 2S-19 Emsta S. Originally developed in 1976, the 2S-19 tank was designed by the Soviet Union as a self-propelled howitzer. Similar in appearance to the T-80, which is another Soviet design, the 2S-19 utilizes a very similar hull, but borrows its diesel engine from yet a different Soviet tank, the T-72. This combination of elements come together to create a vehicle that has a distinctly Russian-Soviet Union feel. That is, until China bought the tank and took it apart to make their own version. Although it was extremely difficult to replicate the original transmission and diesel engine, the Chinese were successful in producing the PLZ-05 tank. Copying the semi-automatic loading system from the 2S-19, as well as modifying its V84A diesel engine into the 8V150 cooled turbocharged diesel engine, the Chinese created another self-propelled howitzer. 
Although the PLZ-05's main armament is 4 meters longer than the 2S-19, both utilize howitzers that fire calibers just 5 millimeters in difference. Even when comparing the look of these two vehicles side by side, it's not hard to see where the Chinese stole their howitzer on wheels from. German Fokker Eindecker plane, copied from the French Moraine Saulnier 8 shoulder wing plane. Anthony Fokker, who was a Dutch aircraft designer working in Germany during World War I, wanted to find a way to mount a gun to the front of his plane without worrying about the bullets hitting his propeller. Previously, engineers had attempted to move the propeller to the back of the plane, clearing the front for an unobstructed firing sight, but this slowed the plane down to an impractical speed. Lucky for Fokker, his answer came falling out of the sky on April 18, 1915, when French pilot Roland Garros was shot down. Although Garros was able to light his Moraine Saulnier shoulder wing plane on fire before being captured, German forces were able to salvage the gun and armored propeller from his aircraft. Studying Garros's plane, Fokker discovered two key French innovations which would help resolve his forward-facing gun problem. First, Fokker examined the synchronizer, which was patented by Garros's colleague Raymond Saulnier. This synchronizer allowed the firing rate of the gun to be timed with the position of the propeller on the plane, so that the gun would never fire while the propeller was in the way. However, machine guns during this period were very unreliable and apt to irregular firing rates. So Fokker's real surprise came when he discovered that Garros's plane had protective wedges fitted onto the propeller blades, which deflected rounds which may have struck the propeller. Fokker had been working on his own design for years, and with this new discovery, he was able to enhance his previous designs to make an elite fighter plane. These discoveries allowed German forces to begin mass-producing planes which featured a front-facing gun. The Fokker Eindecker fighter planes soon became nightmares for Allied pilots, causing casualties in what would become known as the Fokker Scourge. Chinese Type 726A Landing Craft, copied from the U.S. Navy LCAC. The Chinese Navy at the beginning of the 21st century lagged behind all other global powers in their ability to land troops during amphibious operations. Needing a lightweight vessel capable of transporting heavily armored vehicles and tanks, they looked across the ocean to the United States for an answer. The U.S. had been designing and implementing air-cushioned landing craft capable of carrying tanks since the 80s with spectacular results. These landing crafts, also called over-the-beach crafts, allowed the U.S. to access over 70% of the world's coastline. Unlike traditional boat-type landing crafts, the air-cushioned vessels could glide over sandbars or uneven surfaces and swamp land without becoming stuck and without compromising their maximum load capacity. Equipped with four gas turbines, the U.S. Navy's landing craft could reach speeds of 40 knots even with a full load, which could include up to 180 fully equipped soldiers and an M1 Abrams tank. In addition to this, special features on the craft allowed it to operate in numerous capacities, including anti-mine measures, heavy equipment delivery, evacuation, and lane breaching. Unsurprisingly, when China released their Type 726A landing craft in 2010, many were quick to spot the blatant similarities between it and the U.S. Navy's LCAC. Both vessels are propelled by gas turbines, although the Type 726A only has two compared to the LCAC's four. Both can carry over 50 tons and utilize air cushion technology to lift over shallow obstacles, and both vessels can dock without using facilities, enabling them to operate in many dynamic wartime scenarios. China's willingness to adopt technologies and strategies from other countries may seem more shameless amphibious copycats as the U.S. works to improve naval capabilities. U.S. HH-43 copied from the German Flettner Fi-282 During World War II, U.S. Army Air Forces launched Operation Lusty, which aimed to capture and analyze German aeronautical technology on a massive scale. Intelligence teams were dispersed across mainland Europe to infiltrate enemy aircraft, research facilities, and weapons manufacturers. One of the most successful discoveries from this operation was the German Flettner Fi-282, a single-seat helicopter with intermeshing rotors. Unlike previous designs, Anton Flettner, designer of the helicopter of the same name, used two rotors, rotating in opposite directions to eliminate the need for a tail rotor, which was a massive drain on power for the helicopter. Following the conclusion of World War II, U.S. engineers dug out the designs for Flettner's helicopter and decided to try and replicate his intermeshing rotor technology. 
1947, the man himself, Anton Fletner, was flown to New York as part of Operation Paperclip to become the chief designer of the Cayman Company and oversee new designs based on his technology. One of these new designs was the U.S. HH-43 Husky helicopter, which was used for the next two decades by the U.S. Navy and Air Force to carry out intense rescue missions. The Husky helicopter saw widespread use during the Vietnam War and because of its unique ability to hover in place was used in more rescue missions than all other aircrafts combined. A result of Operation Paperclip, which was a secret government program in the United States which allowed former German scientists, technicians and engineers to find jobs working for the American government, Fletner's role in the HH-43 Husky places an exclamation point on the idea of stealing other countries' technology. U.S. M1917 tank, copied from the French Renault FT tank. Germany was not the only country the United States shamelessly stole technology from. After entering the First World War in 1917, U.S. forces quickly realized that tanks were the best technology suited for the battlefield and began researching all designs currently in use at the time. What they found was that the product of a French manufacturing company, Renault Automobile Company, was the most effective revolutionary light tank to be in service. As the first production tank to have a fully rotating turret included inside the armament, the French Renault tank was deployed in huge numbers to overwhelm and swarm enemy lines, utilizing their Hotchkiss machine gun and Puteau cannon with devastating effects. Soon, U.S. Commander-in-Chief General John Pershing launched a program to develop and manufacture the French Renault tank in the United States. Aside from moving the exhaust pipe from the left side of the vehicle to the right, changing the material on the wheels, and adding additional vision slits for the driver, the U.S. version of the Renault tank, the M1917, was an identical copy. The design of the Renault tank still stands against the test of time and is considered the world's first modern tank, with its interior configuration maintaining its status as the standard for all battle tanks to this day. Shameless copies of vehicles exist across countries, periods in history, and cover aircraft, ships, armored vehicles, and weapons. Whether it was American engineers copying the French Renault light tank during World War I, or Chinese manufacturers buying and disassembling Soviet Union tanks, every world power is guilty of snooping on their enemies to gain an edge on the battlefield. Shameless Copycat Uniforms in History Throughout history, uniforms have always been a significant aspect of warfare. Their primary purpose was to give the soldier protection and concealment, but it was also to identify friend from foe. During the 20th century, the tactical significance of uniforms was constantly increasing. The introduction of camouflage patterns provided a soldier with basic features and the ability to conceal himself from the enemy. Recognizing the practicality of camouflage, armed forces throughout the world are investing a lot of resources and money into developing new designs and patterns. Some of them, however, opt to skip the research and development phase and just copy the works of others. These are some of the most famous <laughs> copycat uniforms in history. The British M1942 Pattern Windproof Smock, South Vietnamese Camouflage Uniform. The outbreak of World War II revolutionized the utilization of uniforms by introducing camouflage materials on a larger scale. The Germans were among the first to recognize the importance of camouflage uniforms, primarily for airborne units that were supposed to operate behind enemy lines. The British were quick to follow. The first camouflage uniforms issued to British paratroopers were in fact copies of the German Knochensack, or bone sack smocks. In 1941, however, the British designed their own camouflage pattern smock with a specific brush stroke design. This was designed by Major Dennison, a member of a camouflage unit, who the jacket was named after, and the pattern was created by painting a standard khaki uniform with large mop-like brushes, leaving thin trails at the end of the stroke, hence the name for it. The following year, the British introduced the second pattern, the M1942 windproof smock with a distinctive pinkish tone. The pattern remained unchanged until the late 1950s and was used as a template for many other patterns throughout the world. South Vietnam, though, was producing a copy of the M1942 windproof smock, which had been introduced to them by the French. After World War II, the British Army had donated a batch of smocks to French airborne units. Then, in late 1946, the First Indochina War broke out, and French paratroopers were among the units deployed to fight the Viet Minh forces. 
Vietnamese airborne and commando units also fought alongside them, so they were also dressed in M1942 windproofs. In 1954, the war finally ended, and the French left the region, but the uniforms remained, being very popular among the troops because of their lightweight construction. In 1962, the government of the Republic of Vietnam started producing their own uniforms, copies of the M1942 pattern, exclusively for airborne Yae Zhu units. Like the original windproof, the South Vietnamese copy had a pinkish tan or mauve base, with broad pea green and purplish brown brushstrokes. In 1964, a second version was introduced with slightly muted colors. Along with paratroopers, the uniform was worn by South Vietnamese Special Forces and even U.S. military advisors in the early years of the Vietnam War. The Vietnamese nicknamed the uniform Huyet, or Blood, while the Americans recognized it as Pinks. The British pattern was used until the end of the 1960s when a new Tiger pattern replaced it. The Chinese copy of the British DPM uniform in Britain, it wasn't until the 1960s that the Ministry of Defense would issue uniforms with camo patterns on a mass scale to all branches of the army. Known as Disruptive Pattern Material, or DPM, the British military would use many variations of this type of camouflage until it was replaced with the multi-terrain pattern in 2009. Either due to the effectiveness of this type of camouflage or due to the connections with the British Empire, many nations have adopted similar patterns for use in their militaries, including Oman, New Zealand, Indonesia, Yemen, and many others. DPM has been modified for use in many different environments, from tropical to temperate to desert, and can consist of various shades of green, brown, red, black, and occasionally blue and purple for urban environments. The original standard pattern used by the British military was designated for temperate climates and is made up of brown, green, and black irregular shapes overlaid over a khaki base. Starting in the mid-1970s, the Chinese People's Liberation Army began issuing uniforms in a camouflage pattern as opposed to a solid color. Known as the Type 81 uniform, this design would consist of a light green base over which would be overlaid brown, black, and moss green irregular shapes, all of which bear a similar, albeit crude facsimile of its British counterpart. The uniform would also feature a reversible duck hunter pattern on the inside, increasing its versatility. Duck Hunter, which was also known as Big Five Leaves by the Chinese, consists of irregular spots and splotches on a solid background. The pattern on the Type 81 consisted of brown and two shades of green on a tan background. Initially, the Type 81 uniform would be issued to specialist soldiers such as sappers and airborne troops. It would soon be joined by the Type 84, a similar but slightly different design. Both uniforms would see action in the Sino-Vietnamese War in 1979. Over the years, the DPM pattern would be replaced by other designs, but in the mid-2000s, Special Forces units would be seen with an updated version of the camouflage that originated with the British a half-century ago. The U.S. Desert Battle Dress Uniform, Middle Eastern Countries One of the most recognizable camouflage uniforms is the United States Armed Forces Desert Battle Dress Uniform. The design was developed in the 1970s, ready for a potential engagement in desert conditions, namely in the Middle East. It consists of patches of two shades of mid-brown over a larger area of sand and tan, and is dotted with smaller rock shapes painted black and white. The uniform is also known as the six-color desert pattern due to the number of shades used and the chocolate chip pattern because of the rock shapes that resemble a cookie. The U.S. military used desert battle dress uniform from the early 1980s to the mid-1990s. Its most notable use was during the Gulf War in 1991. The Americans eventually abandoned the pattern because the rock shapes didn't fit in with the Middle Eastern terrain, where there were only large areas of sand. After the Gulf War, many countries in the region started to copy the pattern. Among them were the nations whom the Americans had a good relationship with, such as Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. But also hostile nations such as Yemen, Libya, and Iran copied it as well. The Saudis went the furthest in copying the chocolate chip pattern. The uniform was introduced as the standard camouflage pattern before the Gulf War and has been used in all branches of the armed forces. Even though a tan background pattern is dominant, there are also uniforms with a gray background and dark and light gray camo patches. These uniforms, commonly known as Saudi Desert Camo, are primarily worn by the Royal Saudi Border Guards. Surprisingly, the United States' main antagonist in the area, the Islamic Republic of Iran, also copied the uniform. 
In Iran, the chocolate chip uniforms are reserved for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps elite unit, the Sepa Commandos. Since 2004, Iraqi armed forces have also introduced the chocolate chip as their standard uniform and have produced their own copies. The German Flechtarn, Danish M84 being among the first countries to develop camouflage uniforms, Germany has produced a series of patterns influencing other uniforms throughout the world. After World War II, the armed forces of West Germany adopted a classical olive gray moleskin combat uniform. In 1976, after conducting a trial for a new camouflage uniform, the Bundeswehr chose a Flechtarnmuster, a spot camouflage pattern. However, the new uniform was not introduced until 1989. Over time, the Flectarn pattern underwent several changes, but the principle remained the same. Original Flectarn was a five-colored pattern with black, reddish-brown, dark olive, and medium olive green spots on a moss green background. In 1993, a desert version was introduced with dark olive and reddish-brown spots on a yellow tan background. Over time, the Flectarn pattern proved to be a good design and was used by armies worldwide. One of these was the Danish defense, the armed forces of the Kingdom of Denmark. Like the Germans, the Danes were also using classic M58 olive green uniforms before they decided to switch to a camouflage pattern in the late 1970s. At that time, the Germans had introduced the Flechtarn pattern, and the Danes decided to use the same design. The result was the T-78 test uniform in a spot camouflage pattern. With slight modifications, the pattern evolved into the M84 uniform that became the standard battle dress for Danish soldiers. The Danish uniform was different from the German in that it only had three colors, black, olive green, and light green, the colors of the Scandinavian landscape. Even though the design was a product of the Danish development program and is protected by laws, M84 is undoubtedly a copy of the Flechtarn uniform. Certain pattern shapes are even the same as on the German uniform. In the last 50 years, the palette of uniforms has become so diverse with hundreds of various patterns, but there are only about a dozen pattern styles. As a result, most uniforms cannot be considered copycats, but simply modifications of basic patterns and designs.